Well, welcome back, everyone. Thank you for uh, coming back after lunch. Um, <laughs> everyone says the post-lunch panel is the most challenging one, but, uh, but to me, it's a particularly uh, close one to my heart as someone who, if you look at my career history, uh, worked a lot in this domain, in the culture and arts domain, before getting seduced by hard politics. But even when I worked in the arts and culture domain, it was all about politics. And this is basically the theme of today's panel. We are today uh, looking at uh, art and culture um, from this lens of uh, contentious uh, politics. And um, as ever, housekeeping, translation, ongo is ongoing, uh, Arabic for those who want to uh, tune into that online or, or, or in the room, you know the drill. Um, and the session is, of course, live streamed and on the record. Um, so again, for anyone who wasn't here this morning, I'm Nina Khatib, I'm the director of the Middle East and North Africa program at Chatham House. And it's an utter delight to be uh, welcoming four uh, people who are wonderful cultural producers um, from different places in the region to reflect on their own experiences and the region as a whole um, today. Um, I'm just going to introduce them in the order in which uh, they kind of appear, starting with the virtual appearance of uh, Leila Sansour. Uh, Leila is obviously joining us on Zoom. She is a British-Palestinian filmmaker. Uh, she has been very, very active in uh, creating uh, visual art. Uh, we'll talk a bit about that, most notably about um, Bethlehem. She is well known for her project Open Bethlehem, but she has a current one that we'll talk to her also about later. She's um, joining us now from Istanbul. Um, and then I have uh, next to me uh, Sultan Saud Al Qasimi. Uh, who I first got to know uh, during the uprisings uh, in the Arab world in 2011 because he was one of the champions of uh, human rights and reform um, in the region. Uh, Sultan is an Emirati columnist, researcher, but also curator. Um, he is the founder of the uh, Bergil uh, Foundation, uh, the Bergil Art Foundation. And one of the things that uh, I just deeply admire about Sultan is he's been a tireless collector also of art from all over the region that we'll also talk about uh, today and you'll see why in a bit. And uh, he has been teaching a course called Politics of Modern Middle Eastern Art literally all over the world um, and currently doing that at Bard College in, in Berlin. Um, Next to him, speaking of Berlin, we have another uh, Berlin-based uh, artist who is Yasmina Mitwali, who is uh, Egyptian-Polish. And she um, is also someone who has been shuttling between Cairo and Berlin. She's an artist and filmmaker. And um, again, a lot, of, a lot of her work is very much uh, uh, something that I came across uh, all the way back in 2011 and, and the post-2011 era. And I also love to talk to you about this. The Mussolini Collective is, is one of the initiatives that you were a member of back in the day. Um, so as you can see today, there's a lot of reflections on beginnings and where we are today, both in terms of the trajectories of my speakers' careers in the arts, but also the countries that they have been engaging with. And last but not least, we have Muhammad al attar who is a Syrian playwright, theater maker, and essayist. And again, Muhammad uh, is in Berlin. <laughs> it's a coincidence that the three happen to, to be based in Berlin right now. I mean, Sultan is not normally in Berlin. He's usually in UAE, but he is... Yeah, but no, no, we're, we're going to co-opt him as well. Um, so Muhammad uh, uh, also in his, in his work in theater uh, engages very intimately with issues of um, memory, documentation, um, and also justice. And that's another thing that I'd like to uh, talk to you about in terms of your own um, work. So uh, without further ado, my first question is going to be... Um, uh, for uh, Yasmina. So I mentioned um, 
mousseline, which maybe people in the audience and online don't necessarily know about. But I just wanted to start kind of from there, if, if, if you don't mind, to go back to that era. What was it? What were you trying to do and why? Um, hello, everyone. Nice. I, I hear an echo. Is that normal? Okay. <clears throat> I have to get used to it. <laughs> hearing, hearing my voice like this. Um, hello, everyone. Um, thank you for the invitation. It's really great to be here um, in this uh, panel with, uh, with you three. I mean, I admire your work from afar. Um, I've been following your tweets back in 2011 in Tahrir. And uh, we finally meet in person after so many years. <laughs> And uh, so goes to, to Muhammad, and your writing had also an influence uh, on uh, the different, I feel, um, performative and theatrical um, um, moments that were um, like stemmed out of the, the, that revolutionary momentum also back in, in Egypt, which also has to do with different forms of performing or performativity. Um, within uh, a very uh, uh, difficult state kind of run in, uh, institution. Uh, I, um, I did not start in 2011, um, like my activism sort of um, shifted uh, after the, the, the revolution and during the revolution I was, as many others, protesting in the street and filming um, the ongoing kind of like, struggles, protests. Uh, they took me further than Tahrir uh, to mostly workers' struggles. So factory spaces, both private and public. Um, I was involved in uh, collecting testimonies from uh, during these protests and sit-ins and then further collecting testimonies with groups like against torture campaign, uh, no to military trials on civilians, um, to uh, create or to, to document, not as a form of remembrance or remembering, but as a political tool to investigate these crimes and to um, bring justice to, to those who, who were affected at the time. So that was the premise of the kind of uh, work that we were doing that Back then, I wouldn't call it work or activism. I mean, it didn't really have a labor. Then you had laborers kind of parachuting in, such as citizen journalism, which we, you can discuss this terminology later, which I find a bit problematic. But it was more coming from grassroots engagements all around. Mozerin as a collective came about later uh, through um, like in, in an aftermath, in the aftermath of the downfall of Mubarak, um, during that uh, uh, sexy period with the Supreme Council of Armed Forces, who were sort of the um, the carriers uh, uh, or those who delivered democracy to the people, uh, later uh, with the first so-called first democratic elections, um, and before Muslim Brotherhood came to power. So, I mean, in that period, in those few years, really, there was space for, um, for that. There, it was a momentum that prolonged for about two years uh, where we could uh, manifest our anger, where we could seek justice uh, and have hope. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Um, <laughs> And on that note, Leila, I mean, you're also a filmmaker and you've made documentaries. Um, but I also wanted to talk to you about Open Bethlehem. This is the initiative you set up in 2005. Why did you set it up and what does it do? Uh, I think maybe, can you hear me first of all? Um, so I continue speaking. I believe you probably hear me. Yeah, yeah, yeah we can. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, maybe a few words about my background in general. I actually come from a philosophy background. 
uh, and this is maybe the spirit and the interest with which I entered the world of film, film and filming. Um, so in some ways, I think I've always been interested in the idea of the relationship between thought and action and the political world and the kind of the thinking or culture world. Uh, so in a way, when I started working on films and uh, the situation in Palestine uh, was deteriorating as well, uh, I was I was torn between uh, being interested in the arts and in um, more of a cultural approach to life and my own activities, but also between this and the need to do something for everybody to uh, be politically active, I, I'd say. And in some ways, it was an interesting and strange maybe format for me even to think about that uh, I would need to uh, uh, apply my background to bring it to the political world. Uh, therefore, I think all my films, although they are films and documentaries, had the desire to become something, uh, to, to have a life beyond the film. And I did two do independent documentaries, both in Palestine, uh, one, in 2000 and, um, one in 2003 and one in 2005. Uh, and both had the idea of being, uh, of having a life um, beyond the film itself, uh, trying to reach out to people and create a conversation. So uh, Open Bethlehem specifically was a film about Bethlehem. I documented the building of the wall and it was for the first time uh, a very personal film. I never made personal films before. Uh, and I toured with it very widely. Uh, and the film, if you wish, uh, initiated a camp whole campaign that was trying to use Bethlehem as a doorway into Palestine. Uh, Bethlehem as a city generally does uh, create an opportunity for changing the conversation around Palestine. And it was a very um, big experience for me touring with that film, uh, touring within the States, in Europe, uh, particularly, uh, I have to say, in the States. Um, I mean, the film was screened in Congress, for example, uh, with the idea of introducing the whole Palestinian issue to Americans, to Westerners, to the prism of one city that they all know, that they all love, that they all sing for, um, to introduce them to the, the problem in Palestine, to the prism of a, a, a dying city, really, a dying historical city that has a vibrant community, but it is um, in danger, and it's in, in real danger to lose um, much of its heritage and, uh, and many of the people who lived there and, and made up the culture of the place. So that was uh, the, the project that I was involved with, with almost for almost 10 years, although I have moved on now to a new one, uh, now uh, a new project called Planet Bethlehem, uh, and I can probably talk about it later once um, some other speakers have... Um, introduce their, their previous projects, because this is a, a big story now for me, the new project, uh, which is a museum for Bethlehem. Okay, thank you, Leila. So um, already we're seeing from Yasmina and Leila two, two examples of art being very much used in a very deliberate way to document, to also inform, I suppose, um, uh, the world. It's, it's, uh, it's a very, um, I think, clear example of why in a lot of these policy circles, unfortunately, the arts don't tend to get as much attention. But you can already, I hope, see why the arts should get central attention and not just marginal attention. I mean, Leila gave us the example of her film being screened in Congress. I think it doesn't get more policy than that. Uh, and I only say this because this is Chatham House. I don't necessarily would be saying this in other contexts, but it's very important because here in these circles, we don't often, I must admit, ad engage with these, with these um, uh, art and cultural circles enough. Um, Muhammad, turning to you, what I'm also hearing from Yasmina and Leila is this issue of memory and the role of, uh, well, in their cases, visual 
uh, art, visual culture in memory. So I know you also engage in this, in your own work, in, 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 in theater and writing. So I'd love for you to also tell me your motivation and how you kind of approach that and why. Thank you, Lina, and thank you very much for having me here. It's a great pleasure to be here and to share the platform with such wonderful um, panelists and colleagues. Um, I'll try to be brief. I mean, I have to say something like Yasmina already mentioned. I started working after the revolution in Syria uh, with an obsession of documentation. So that was my first motive, actually. So theater as an experimental artistic uh, medium was not something really um, present in my mind, which I used to do before the revolution. I didn't start doing theater with the revolution, but with uh, the moment of the uh, Syrian explosion or the revolution, the uprising, for me documentation uh, was um, a necessity. So uh, I thought I can use my tool, which is of course theater, writing, making theater, as a parallel way of writing the story of the Syrian upheaval. Uh, uh, and, and, and the early days, of course, that um, imposed certain techniques because the moment was still unfolding, still the beginning. So I went uh, after um, pure documentic, d documentary forms, something not exactly like here in England. I think, I think they call it very patent theater. It's not exactly like this, but something that gives um, a big weight to the raw materials, and then you treat them. And, and the idea was actually the sphere of um, that, uh, um, the narrative of the people, um, I say the people, uh, people who like uh, participated in the revolution, the uprising, uh, should be somehow also reflected through art. You know, it's, it's, for me, I always think about art uh, uh, with the different formats or forms as a, a parallel way of writing the history also. So it's a parallel history, it's, uh, it's, and it's, it's equally important in my eyes at least. So that was the start. With time, of course, with the changes that happen in Syria, with the situations, recently I'm more occupied with the question of narrative and memory out of concrete fear of the erasing of, of the threat that this narrative is, is, will, uh, is erased. And uh, uh, I tend in the early days of the uprising to think that this might happen after 100 years. But now we are standing roughly 12 years after, and there is a generation in the Arab world, forget about outside the Arab world, they knew almost nothing or they knew a very um, manipulated version about what happened in 2010, 2011. Uh, I have nieces who live in, in Syria and um, it scares me always, almost always, sorry, when I speak to my sister and she tells me somehow, because people cannot speak very uh, freely when they speak, they are inside Syria, so we always have our uh, technique to pass messages, that she can't tell her daughters what happened in Dothandra. Because they go to school, public school, and, uh, you know, and this is um, still very much a uh, 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 police state typical authoritarian uh, state where you cannot, uh, where you are very careful what you tell your kids, uh, so uh, uh, you're afraid what they can speak out. So I'm speaking about like something like even <laughs> within my family. Uh, so this fear of course drive me in the last years to be very obsessed with this question about, uh, which is of course not, re uh, not all, uh, sorry, not uh, um, related just to the Syrian context, which is who writes the history, who owns the narrative? especially in, the, in, a, in a situation like Syria where we, uh, and I'm not pessimistic, where, where we are defeated, temporarily I would say, defeated um, politically, our dreams of uh, achieving a democratic state or achieving a, a transition where we, uh, 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 where justice and social justice are prevailing, it's defeated, badly defeated I would say. So, uh, and, and in my opinion, one of the only fields remaining fields that the struggle can continue is uh, the struggle of, of narratives, the battle of narratives. I do believe that as long as you have a story, uh, a solid story, as long as you have uh, a narrative, you are not totally erased. And that's why I'm very, very um, obsessed with this question. I'm trying to reflect in, through, through the work and trying sometimes even to jump to the future 
to imagine kind of this, this uh, dystopian reality where um, nobody knows what happened in 2010, 2011, in Tunis, in Egypt, in Libya, in Yemen, in Syria, and, and what kind of future is, is, is uh, possible when you have this kind of um, raised memory or raised narrative because I can speak about Syria like we had uh, uh, tr um, terrible times, time of troubles in the early 80s and my generation, I was born in 1980 and there was a huge massacre in, in the city of Hama in 1982 and my generation knows nothing about this massacre and when we, when we used to mention the massacre, we used to say the events of Hama, Ahdas Hama we never referred it as the massacre of Hama. Yeah. So this is something I know from my generation, how we uh, were born around the same time that uh, people were killed and massacred. Uh, after 10, 15 years, we knew nothing about this past. You know? And we even, uh, sometimes with, with no any bad intentions, we, we, we were uh, not even trying to dig about these things. So that's, for me, why Today, this question about memory, narrative, history, and the, the ro role of art, in my, in my uh, case, theater, in trying to keep the struggle alive and, and to keep um, the question alive. Thank you. And uh, on that note, I want to turn to you, Sultan, because again, uh, I don't know how much people know, but you own probably, in my view, the largest collection of political art from the region. Um, and my understanding is that it's a gender-balanced collection as well, which, again, may be fascinating to some people to find out that the region has a rich history of women and men uh, who have produced, um, po you know, political art. And, 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 you know, you have collected this for a number of years now. And speaking of keeping memory alive and archiving and all that, I'd love for you to tell me more about what motivated you to start this collection and also perhaps when was the earliest piece in your collection created? Because that's another thing, because now, you know, we're anchoring ourselves in 2011, but of course, all these debates did not start in 2011, and all this art did not suddenly just uh, start being created in 2011. The, the, the region actually has a very rich history of uh, very cultural, uh, political richness that, that deserves to be remembered. So, over to you. Uh, Lina, I think the translator is going to hate me because of how fast I'm going to try to speak. Uh, well, there's so much to say. Uh, I think uh, just building on the points of uh, uh, Yasmina and Muhammad and Leila as well, uh, art is a very important tool in documenting histories that have been erased purposely and through uh, oblivion. Sometimes uh, archives are erased. I can give you two examples of an Egyptian artist called Inji Aflatoun, who documented uh, in the 1940s a massacre that took place. The British uh, uh, um, caused this massacre in Egypt, and there was no documentation for it. It was called the Massacre of Den Shaway in 1906. There was no documentation, no photographs, very little articles written. She went and she created a series of paintings, really just uh, uh, very p powerful images of British soldiers overlooking the hanging uh, of Egyptian pe peasants and farmers and workers at the hands of the brutal occupation in the turn of the century. And that is what one of the causes of the Arabi um, revolution in 1919 was that massacre. So there was no documentation of it, but this art is documented. Fast forward 50 years, Gazbi Yasserri documents uh, in 1955, a massacre that occurred under the kingdom of Egypt of uh, the, the police pushing students and laborers into the Nile in the uh, um, uh, um, in one of the uh, in one of the Nile uh, towns, Medina uh, Al Why am I forgetting it? Uh, where the factories? In Mahalla, thank you. There was a massacre of Mahalla, thank you. Of course, Hisham would know. So there was a massacre in Mahalla, but under that regime, they weren't able to document it. So artists go back and document these, th these events. The same thing happened with Leila Ansayr, who was a uh, Syrian artist. She documented the, the death of a very famous activist. None of us have heard of her, called Mary Rose Boulos. She died in the 1970s. Uh, she was a Syrian 
um, uh, uh, activist who helped a lot of Palestinian children, and there was nothing about her documented until Tel Adnan, an artist, wrote her story in a book called Sit Mary Rose, and Leyland Sayer documented her artwork in, in a painting. And so art has a way of preserving these memories that youngsters tend to forget. The first, the first iterations of the, the first iterations, visual iterations of the uh, uh, Libyan, uh, Tunisian, Egyptian uh, revolutions were all done uh, uh, in art. Art allows you to talk about subjects that you can't talk about in public. I'll give you an example of the Gulf. In the Gulf, uh, talking about labor rights is very contentious. This is the title of the talk. It's very contentious to talk about labor rights in the Gulf. But through art, through the work of Muhammad Kazam, through the work of uh, Reem al Ghaith, through the work of Qatar, Faraj Daham, the first tour from the UAE, Faraj Daham and others, you can talk about the, the, the labor issues. There was a, a young artist from Dubai who took uh, helmets of laborers, uh, uh, construction workers, and she placed it in this very elite area of Dubai. And all these people who go and enjoy their, you know, their time and the oblivious to who built the space, you see uh, uh, helm, uh, helmets, they call, they call them helmets, uh, 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 of construction workers put around you. So they're there. They're not there, but they're there because they're sort of, they're present through their absence, through this symbolic gesture. So uh, the same thing happens in Saudi with, the, with talking about the role of religion, the role of the state, the role of al-wasaya, guardianship against women. These are all issues that you can talk about in public, but through art it gives you the, uh, the ability. One last thing you say that we have a collection of political art. Today we have a set of works that I cannot loan in public because of how contentious they are. I cannot loan works that are uh, without, unless I get permission from the artist, unless, they are, uh, unless the artist gives me explicit uh, uh, permission because of how contentious they are, because they talk about the Arab Spring because they talk about LGBT rights, because they talk about women's rights, because they talk about certain individuals. And so it really is a fascinating world, but it's a very problematic world as well. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to get into the issue of actual threat and risk um, in a bit, because I think it's, it's very um, important. But um, I want to turn back to Leila and, and speaking about your current project, Planet Bethlehem, that you um, are working on right now. It'll be an immersive space online, and it will have an archive of Bethlehem. And I want to anchor this, if I may, in the current uh, events happening in Palestine, um, because the narrative out there is, uh, unfortunately, at least in the mainstream media, a very um, black and white narrative in many ways. It's uh, a, a narrative of who's good and who's bad, and it, I feel it's very problematic on so many levels, and you are telling the history of Bethlehem in a very different way, and you want people to engage in a very kind of, I think, vivid way with this issue of what is Palestine. So I'd love for you to tell us more about this current project. Yes, thank you. I, uh, it's uh, very interesting talking about it coming after all what the, the, my colleagues just said just now about memory. Uh, I think uh, this is a big issue that anybody walking in uh, our shoes as Palestinians will face all the time, as in what are our rights when it comes to memory. Uh, obviously, uh, in many cases, we uh, face problems such as what, is, what, what memories we're allowed to have and what memories we're not allowed to have, and how you struggle to make these memories that you're not allowed to have visible. Uh, and that's been a big, I think, task for uh, for me as well as many other, other Palestinians, particularly. But I think because of the issue of Palestine has been going on for so long, other problems with memory also emerge, such as you start realizing, if you're an artist or working in the cultural field, that memory isn't just a, a simple thing. Memory isn't just a, a series of facts that we remember and we make visible. Uh, memory is also a space where we create ourselves, as a creative space. So we choose, we edit, we curate what we want to remember. We actually give it a completely new color, how we want to shape our memories. People, uh, nations that stand on their feet and uh, feel a bit freer than us, 
uh, have the right to kind of spread their wings and go back to their history and take flight, paint that history in speculative ways, ways, imaginative ways, ways that allow them to paint the future for themselves, create new channels that they want to see. And I think uh, I increasingly started realizing that this is one of the things that I feel I've been denied uh, in terms of my own history and my, our own memory. So with this museum, one of my great dreams is to create a space where we could go back to sort of um, create new futures by looking at our past in different ways and in ways that we choose, in ways that we curate in ways where we are agents uh, of the path, of our path from the past to the future. So the museum will have, be underpinned by an archive, but it will create a series of digital exhibitions that will all be based, each exhibition will be based on a, a meta-narrative that will try to tell the story of Bethlehem from a particular angle, most of the time maybe from a, a place where people what that people don't expect. People haven't seen that side of Bethlehem. Uh, sometimes they are imaginary uh, uh, narratives as well. And we have the right to those. I want to say that we have the right to speculative memory, to imagination. That is that kind of space. Thank you so much. And I mean, it's, it's so important what you're saying, because again, it goes beyond just the right to uh, as you said, to, to be agents of our own past and our own memories, but also the right to be imaginative about our memories. And um, this takes me to Mohammed. Um, I know that you're working on uh, theatrical projects uh, that revolve around the issue of justice. And again, here we are also talking about the issue of, of agency and, 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 you know, kind of people um, again, your play is anchored in reality, but it's not um, a, a documentary as such. So you are also, you know, being imaginative in the way you engage. So I'd love for you to tell us more about how you went down this route of commenting on justice through your current work. Um, it's, I mentioned briefly uh, in, my pre um, in my previous answer that there, in my opinion there are still few battlefields where we can still um, uh, uh, resist um, the comprehensive defeat. And one of them, I spoke about narrative and memory, one of them is justice. Okay. Of course, and there are battles are concretely uh, uh, are being uh, uh, fought now in, in some courts. Um, um, in Europe especially, to bring some of the regime, uh, I'm speaking about Syria now, uh, regime official, official, uh, officers, uh, especially from the security apparatus, uh, to hold them accountable. It's the start of a process. I'm not an expert in this, but, but combining justice and imagination, I think here where I can feel free to reflect. Um, and I think one of the um, um, strength, uh, uh, Sultan mentioned something about uh, uh, the art and the capacity of art uh, when it comes to uh, documenting, but also I think this imagination gives us also um, uh, uh, room to maneuver around the bleak reality and to jump some time over this bleak reality, not to fall into the trap of uh, uh, how to say, uh, illusion, but sometimes just to try to think beyond the deadlock. Because honestly, I'm speaking about myself now, if I leave myself to the objective, rigid reality, I will die tomorrow, like literally, I will commit suicide. And this is happening almost on a weekly basis among Syrians, youth. So, and that's why imagination is important. And, and this art provides us with this imagination. And that's why my work um, is described largely as documentary based, but I think it was always and still and more 
um, uh, playing on this boundary between documentation and, and, and fiction and imagination. Back to your question, to be more precise, uh, for me, the question of justice, not, not, not just it represents one of the few battlefields that we still can uh, show resilience and we still can fight for, ob for concrete objectives, but also for me, it's, it's, it's becoming, um, uh, the discussion about it is, is fascinating, especially after a, a key moment, uh, which is a trial that happened in Germany, in, in a city called Koblenz. It's the first of its kind, please correct me if I'm wrong, because again, I'm not expert, where two uh, 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 officers who, who ran away from Syria, so they used to serve uh, with the security, the regime, the Assad security um, apparatus, and they ran away, and they wanted to start a new life in Germany as a refugees, asylum seekers, uh, they were, after a series of encounters, they were like uh, put into trial, and the trial happened. And for me, why that was a key moment, I will not go into details about the trial itself, because for the first time, the, the, the term justice is, has been moved from its kind of uh, symbolic and metaphorical sphere, because justice and social justice is one of the key slogans of our revolutions, uprising. These are our, our, our slogans, yeah? <coughs> but for me, Copland's, it moved the term or the discussion about the term from its symbolic and metaphorical sphere to something concrete. And out of sudden, we had to face, okay, now we have a court. What is justice then? Because among people who share the same political affiliation, we had a lot of aggression fight. No, this is not justice, this is justice. You can't hold, this, uh, hold them accountable for you, hold the head of the regime. And we had countless arguments, and, and for me it was an eye-opening, because now we have, we are at a time where, where, we, where we need to discuss the concrete meaning of justice, uh, not just its kind of symbolic or its kind of uh, romantic uh, meaning, because because from now on, we have really to, to, to be engaged in discussion about uh, justice, justice and again, and how it's unfolded in courtrooms about transition, because we know that in countries like Syria, in the future, hopefully, uh, hopefully, we have to live together, perpetrators and victims. So th because the, uh, the violations happen on a larger scale, there is no way you, you can put everybody in court. Or, so, so from here, I, I'm started to work on the term. It, it's exactly from bringing it from its symbolic, from its kind of more romantic sphere to its practical sphere. Thank you so much. Yes, Mina, if I may turn to you. So you kindly gave me this earlier. Um, it's called On Trials, A Manual for the Theater of Law. And it's uh, a book that uh, you uh, have uh, put out alongside Philippe Rizé. So speaking of justice and courts and theater, I would love for you to tell us more about this project and again, how it came about and why. Um, I need to look at it just so because I, I can't remember the, the trajectory, but it all started with, a, with another film that uh, uh, Philip uh, Risk and myself um, made in, in Egypt, which was, it was called Out on the Streets, uh, Baraf Shara, and it was, it was 2014, um, which was a very um, shifting moment politically from uh, uh, Muslim Brotherhood to Rabah uh, and the massacre of Muslim Brotherhood, and then um, uh, Sisi taking power. And in that shift, very quickly, a lot of the work that we were doing, which was mostly testimonial and um, documenting uh, for a purpose to present in the court, actually. Um, we, uh, not like all of us kind of realized that there, this is the moment where we need to decide, uh, you know, either to, uh, um, you know, put a pause on this or go away for a bit or like shift the, the way and like, imagine a different way of, of working. Um, um, in order to sustain something that we already had within ourselves, which is to, to pursue justice or to, to, to pursue um, truth and to, 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 to negotiate it somehow. 
given that people were being tried for, for that and arrested and kidnapped and tortured. And um, one, of the, one of the ways to do that is to, to, to shift to fiction and to fictionalize the truth. And um, this is when we, um, for a while, we, we've been close to one factory called Mission de Cause in Hinoen. Uh, a factory that was bought by a Kuwaiti uh, businessman and dismantled and sold for scrap. Um, and we followed that story of this privatized factory, which is, was a very common practice in Egypt, post 70s, post Sadat, post Mubarak, privatizing um, land, uh, I mean, turning land to factory, factory spaces and um, like automation land worker and then uh, slowly privatizing and then illegal dismantling of factory for real estate for for money um, so this is what happens there and uh, we followed closely a group of workers who kind of um, stayed there they had their own kind of they had their own tahrir in the in, in the factory there was over 80 um, protests at the time happening in that period and earlier and um, and we, we you know we made a documentary about it or like one of those short videos that we did as part of the group, um, and then uh, one of the uh, one of the workers worked as a guard. He was like many work. I'm, I'm like really going fast through the history because it's a lot to say, but um, many of the workers they took the deals and left the protest. Some of them uh, got tired uh, or got another job, but there was this like last five. And one of them was a guard, and he was documenting everything with his phone. And while he was documenting ev like everything as it was going in, in within like eight months, uh, like he shows how how the factory changed or how it disappears in front of your eyes. And he also narrates what you cannot see. So he speaks about what he remembers from that space of labor, which is no longer there. So he says stuff like, you know, and you know, here there was the sound of, of this machinery, and he describes the machinery, what it did, and what was its purpose. But now you can only hear the sound of a bird song, and you know, he 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 documents it for a very specific reason to then present it in the courts of law, and he he goes with it with on the CD, as the workers they have their own case against the new owner, and he gets uh, uh, kicked out of the of of the, of the courtroom. The, 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 the judge goes like, you know, like, leave. Uh, you're not allowed to, to, to present your, your evidence. It's, it's, it's not legally obtained evidence. Um, and that kind of makes it into the, the film, into the fiction, uh, where, yeah, we continue with this, with, with, with this idea of reimagining or showing something. Um, and it root, it's rooted in theater. Uh, I wanted my, my father was a theater maker, and I wanted to work with him on on this performance with non actors mm -hmm. none, uh, that were coming from that um, people who were interested in collaborating from 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 that neighborhood. And um, and I mean that's a product to this, <laughs> but uh, that's a different film that didn't make it into a film for these specific reasons of not being able to, to, to continue in a way, and not being able to continue in Egypt. But of a was sort of our last uh, thing that we filmed in, in, in Cairo. And then the, the film that didn't happen made it into a book. And it consists of these different uh, attempts or per performances or manuals on how to, how to make a film on, on the law how to sew a costume, how to dress for the law. Um, and it's, it, it, it's a series of interviews and conversations that we have with lawyers, and, but also with, with, with people with whom we work closely uh, on the street, but also in the courtroom, like a camera person with whom we, we documented protests, but who also sneaked out footage from the courthouse um, for us to like to, 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 to work with, basically. Um, so, what was your question? No, I asked you how this, this, this came yeah, about yeah. and why, and you've explained it vividly. <laughs> and actually, what, one of the things that I've distilled from what you're saying is also how the context can, in many ways, sometimes also shape the form. 
And so what you sought out to do first was film, but because of the limitations to do with actual risk, you ended up with perhaps the more the safer form of a book. And, and, and this is something that I actually want to um, just pick up on. Egypt at the moment, it's not a very hospitable space when it comes to uh, critique of the government, when it comes to uh, speaking of who owns the narrative. You know, there's a very clear attempt. Even the government itself is a cultural producer in some ways because I understand that uh, TV series are, are, are being made by the military establishment, adverts, um, pop, pop kind of cultural products. So how is the situation for Egyptian artists? How much space do they have to push boundaries in this kind of context? I mean, the freedom, uh, there's, there's, a, there's a new law that's not so new anymore under Abdel Fattah al-Sisi that um, against freedom of expression, um, or not against per such, but if, if, if it is too critical of the state or if it is too, or if it, or if it's, if the work is against or the behavior is against family morals or family values. Mm -hmm. So these are, there's different laws that then are also put under a larger law, which is like an, a terrorist law, um, which was um, um, enacted in, I think, 2017. I'm, I'm not sure. Um, so I think, I mean, just, just, just thinking about the, the, not the last panel, but the previous one, um, and there was a moment, like a debate around, uh, you know, how do we meet at a table? Like, what kind of discussion do we have between the opposing forces in the state, and then the question about so who is the opposition? Uh, is are we speaking about the opposition from 2011 per se, like what went wrong then, or are we maybe uh, contesting a, a, a future that, um, or are we in a future that did not happen, which is uh, the and it and it did not happen not only for the reasons as such, the generational activist. Uh, 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 you disputes. know, disputes of uh, at the time in post 2011 January, uh, post Mubarak, or or is it does it go deeper? Is it does it really come from quote unquote like ignorance or like cultural uh, in awareness? I think I think not. I think it comes from um, like the, the the very space to have this kind of debate is uh, is, is 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 violated. Um, there's, there are laws, new laws that are enacted. Laws can be very easily enacted. They just need to be spoken. <laughs> they just need to be spoken out loud, and and then they become the the premise for everything. Mm, uh, human rights are, are are being violated today. Um, there's um, and that goes into so many different departments in the arts, in journalism. The only independent uh, newspaper, Madame Mostre, is threatened. Alina Abdullah, who is the editor-in-chief, is facing, uh, under the same terrorist act, She's, she and three other journalists are uh, uh, fa facing, uh, pot potentially going to prison. Um, there's no space for, for to, I mean, there's no, no space to negotiate. I, I mean, I'm, a, I'm more on the pessimist side. I mean, I, I do believe that turning to fiction and turning to imagination is a way and needs to, needs to be, and we need to fight for it. But even that is being uh, suppressed uh, under these laws. So, no, it doesn't look very, uh, yeah. yeah. Thank you. And I will turn to the audience for uh, questions, but I wanted to pick pick up uh, on, on this issue of fictionalizing the truth, Sultan, and also someone like yourself when you're saying art allows us to talk about the things that otherwise, you know, perhaps societies would frown upon, but sometimes the law also frowns upon these issues. Um, how are people able to get away with it in this, in this context, in, in the Gulf, for example? I mean, when someone, you said, makes an exhibition and has helmets of workers, does this come with consequences? Uh, <coughs> thank you. Yeah, well, I think that uh, artists are very smart, uh, and I think that artists find ways uh, to be subversive and find ways to 
put out their message without being immediately identified. Uh, you sometimes don't understand. Um, I don't know how the problem is. There are so many things I can say, but I cannot say. Um, there, there is an artwork uh, by a, a GCC collective uh, show, uh, showing you a, uh, a table uh, of the GCC leaders. Anything. And it's just a table. And it's beautiful. I think mahogany wood, it's gorgeous. There's nothing wrong with it. The only thing is that it's small. And I leave it, at, I leave it there. And so if you, if you think about the context, then you understand mm. what it means. Mm. But there's nothing wrong with it. There's, there's, no one is being offended. It's just there. Uh, and there's so many other examples. Um, and, I, and I think that uh, it's just difficult to out people you know, out people about their, their ideas and what they think and what they mean and reinterpret them. Um, but I think there's so much space for interpretation of what artworks are. Um, for example, Manal al in Saudi she did an artwork where she had these uh, uh, pigeons or doves made out of uh, porcelain, and each one of them had on the wings a, uh, the permission to travel, the women's permission to travel. But the names have been removed, and so the permission has not been granted. So the birds are, are, uh, uh, are suspended. The, uh, the artwork is called Suspended yeah, uh, in Flight. You've seen it. Yeah. And so it's very smart. It's a, it's a very critical work about a current uh, topic. And there's so many other examples. Um, but maybe just to pick up on, um, on the issue of social justice, art also allows you to talk about social justice. We talked about social justice when it comes to laborers. But there's social justice, for example, when it comes to minorities that have been wronged in the Arab world, especially in the last 60, 70 years. Um, I can tell you, for instance, uh, in the 1950s and 60s, uh, uh, thousands of Nubians in Egypt have been forcibly moved out of their homes so that they can build this giant lake and dam. Uh, and where did you get the social justice? Where, uh, there is no social, just social justice, but where did you get the documentation? Artists went down and documented these lives of these individuals who were forced out of their homes. When, when you talk about, for example, uh, the gender balanced nature of our collection, women's rights in the region have been taken away. And in 2019, when I said, I will never show an exhibition where there's less than 50% women. Mm -hmm. And I had a lot of people upset. You said, they said, you cannot do this. You are rewriting history. You are not showing. Uh, the fact was that there were better male artists. There were more male artists exhibited. There were more. And I said, I don't care. I don't care. We're going to show equal number of men and women, and you can all go to hell. And we showed, we showed equal number of men and women, and nothing happened to the world, as far as I know. I mean, some things happened. But, but I remember calling in one of the critics of the, of, the, of the idea. I can tell you why the critics were upset. They said, for example, how can you show an equal number of men and women when only 10% of women got scholarships to do art? And I said, you know, you know what, let's, let's try, let's investigate. Let's show an equal number of men and women art, instead of showing what Western museums, because we tend to mimic the West, uh, and everything. So instead of West, what Western museums show you here, 10% of women and 90% men, we said we're going to do 50-50, and, and let's see what happens. And then we realized that, that uh, women actually were smart enough to do works. Yes, they can do sculptures and monuments because they're not getting the commissions, but they're doing works uh, uh, on ceramic. They're doing tapestries. They're doing henna. They're doing pottery. They're doing dolls. They're doing photography. They're doing so many other mediums that's allowed for them. So that is art. And I remember calling in one of, the, one of the scholars who was very critical, and I said, could you please visit the show and tell me, have you seen a difference? Do you feel that there's a difference physically that women art is so offensive and so bad and poor? And they said, no, we, haven't, we don't feel that the work, that the exhibition is weaker. And so I think you can, uh, you can introduce the idea of social justice, showing works about Nubians, showing works about the Amazigh, Showing works about uh, the minorities that have been wronged in the Arab world, and about genders, again, LGBT, and all these things that we need to, uh, to talk about. Absolutely. And what you're saying is also, it's not just about, about the art itself commenting on social justice or being engaged with it, but it's also you and your very conscious choice to also champion social justice through your practice. So basically anyone who is giving a platform, let's say for artists from the region, needs to also bear that framework in mind in terms of how you curate whatever exhibition you're gonna have or whatever collection. Um, 
So it's not just about the work itself, it's also about the choices and, and yes. I want to add one last yeah. thing. For example, and I, I, I don't have a notepad so I can't <laughs> remember everything I want to say, but for example, the issue of Palestine is so central to all of us. Mm -hmm. And one way you can do this is show in the exhibition very subtly, you don't need to go and shout out and, 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 you know, and, uh, and do things that people do in some places where they're allowed to do, but what you can do is maybe just show works by artists mm -hmm. who are showing the centrality Mm. of the Palestinian cause, the centrality of the ideas that we all believe in social justice when it comes to Palestine. Artists from all over the Arab world have depicted the Palestinian cause. So you just put it there, subtle, if you're smart enough, you'll understand it. It's there. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, well, we have some time for questions. So anyone in the audience, please introduce yourselves and wait for the microphone. So we have two at the front, which I'm going to take together. Thank you. Uh, I'm Hilda, Centre for International Peace Building. Thank you so much. Uh, I feel your pain. And I also feel that you have in common that you've been extraordinarily able to show absence. The empty table, the museum of people that are no longer there, uh, the massacre that you were too young to witness, but you felt it in your bones. And your film, and which didn't become a film, but became a book. And I'm reminded of Wittgenstein who said, you know, what cannot, there are things that can be said and there are things that can only be shown. And you've all been forced to show them. And I wonder whether it's an accident that you're all in Berlin, which is a story that knows about this and the Stolperstein and the, the stumble stones for all the people that disappeared. So I just wonder whether this is a kind of significant, the city of Recht, of course. Thank you. And there was someone behind you, and then we'll turn to you afterwards, so taking sets of three. So yes, you're next. I'm Ziski from the Wikimedia Foundation, and I'd love to hear the panelists' thoughts on the role of technology and also new mediums in these initiatives that you are pursuing to document and amplify memories, but also perhaps how they are changing and expanding whose voices can be included and what audiences can be reached and maybe also how they're changing what forces you're actually fighting against, perhaps because the regimes are also using these tools very effectively, or because there are additional or heightened forms of surveillance and risk. Thank you so much. And yes, please. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you for this really, really insightful panel. Uh, I don't believe it has suffered from being uh, after lunch. So uh, Valeria Scudo from Sibeline. There was a mention about um, in terms of if you're smart, you will understand it. But it is artists and art forms may not be immediate for everyone. And so also linking to the question of new mediums, how do you approach the question of preserving both the context, the art form, and the memory of it for future generations. Okay, thank you. Um, and I'm going to ask everyone actually to comment because the questions cut across everybody. So Leila, let's start with you. And you can pick on any or all of the questions. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously not in Berlin, so I'm uh, the odd one out in this instance. I'm not either, so. Um, yeah. Um, I suppose uh, one of the questions I can answer is uh, the question of what the new media allows us. And I think the fact that uh, we can contemplate to build a whole national museum in a way, I mean, maybe calling it national is a little bit of a, a, like maybe a big title for it. I mean, it's a museum of a city, although it's also... A, a, um, in a sense, also a museum for a nation. Um, I mean, new ways of uh, presenting information uh, online obviously opens great opportunities and almost allows you to build an, a virtual identity or a virtual collective identity, a virtual national identity. And as I think Mohammed said that uh, at some point that uh, what can you do if uh, reality is so grim and also if the reality is absolutely uh, blocked by an impasse, uh, which is, I think, what we experience today as Palestinians. I mean, I'm very different to other people on the panel on, on some level that what we are facing at the moment is not an internal societal strife, 
but uh, effectively a colonial still problem that somehow stumbled into the 21st century and we're struggling against an issue that normally is seen today as being a scenario from the past. Uh, but for us, uh, the impasse means that we are being challenged as to what are the steps we can take. And I think we can take the step of building ourselves in the world of imagination, building ourselves in the virtual world, um, creating new um, roads forward to start with in how we can imagine a way forward, uh, how we can imagine retaining a sense of um, our own identity and our own trajectory and desires uh, and making um, our path, I suppose, brighter and more interesting for ourselves for it. Uh, so I am very sympathetic to what Mohammed said about uh, the arts and the ability of the arts to try and override an impasse, override a grim reality, to try and imagine a different way of moving forward. And um, I think in my case, for example, with this museum, we, I want to try my very best to create a reality that will be so vivid that it uh, could challenge the idea of how you experience the world virtually or in real life, so that the virtual world uh, uh, reminds us that the world of imagination is just as powerful and strong and is capable of uh, almost taking us out of a grim reality. So maybe yeah. that's one of my probably. Uh, Thank you. Thank you so much. To Thank you, Leila. That's 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 wonderful and inspiring. Um, Mohammed, why don't we turn to you? Uh, yeah, I can speak about Berlin. Um, 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 I think it's not a coincidence, honestly. I mean, I know that Sultan is is uh, doing a fellowship there, so it's temporary. But I think I think it's not it's not a temp uh, it's not coincidence that three of us. But I think uh, Berlin is becoming the capital of exile. Uh, f especially from people from Levant, the Arab world, for many, many reasons. Um, uh, uh, but for me, not going to this reason, because that needs maybe another panel, but uh, it, it's for me, it's uh, on a personal level, and uh, my, my, my friends here, colleagues, can maybe elaborate. It's fascinating to go to uh, Berlin with, with all its complicated history. Uh, it's a place where uh, Walter Benjamin and Hannah Arendt flee also, no? and now we are uh, save, seeking refuge there. And I, I, I mentioned those two because I'm, I'm, uh, I, I adore their work. So, so for me, it's really fascinating to see the cycle and how things are changing. And also, it's not, it's not, um, it's not just about the diaspora or the intellectual diaspora or the uh, middle, middle class diaspora, but also uh, from the Arab region, but also from Eastern Europe and elsewhere, Latin America. So Berlin is, is now, it's really interesting place to, to, to see this phenomena uh, growing. Briefly about the technology, because I have a personal dilemma, d dilemma uh, about your question about how, because um, I'm, a, I'm a still a very old school when it comes to theater, so I don't like to, to broadcast theater online. I'm really r very rigid about it. But this is this is problematic because because one of the limitations of theater is that it has a very limited audience, and unfortunately, theater is associated of being elitist a bit with who's coming, and this is. I know this is, I'm aware of this, but I don't think this is the reality of theater because also theater has multiple forms and theater can go, goes to people also too. And we did this in Syria, we went to um, uh, rural areas to remote uh, villages, we worked with juvenile uh, and uh, people in the juvenile institute, with, with refugees back then, before the Syrians became refugees. Palestinians or Iraqis or Somalis, uh, but still, still, I'm, I'm very skeptic, but, but it's a very challenging question on a personal level, uh, this thing about uh, archiving theater or, 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 or transforming theater from this unique thing, because how theater survived since forever till today, since the Greek, let's, know, let's speak about the phenomena that we know very well, because it still maintains this something very unique that it's happening now for you, like, because Okay, there are theater pieces that are performed 100 times, but every night it's a different piece because if I'm the actor, tomorrow I'm uh, older one day. Yeah, so I'm not the same actor yesterday. I'm not the same actor tomorrow. So honestly, every, every piece is unique, and that's why I think theater survives uh, many things from the 
printing things to TV, to cinema. Still theater have this charm of the happening, of, of something happened now and, and happening like uh, with this uh, fascinating or charming encounter between uh, spectators and, 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 and actors and this kind of black, dark things. And so, so this is my kind of um, dilemma because I'm aware that things are changing and I'm aware that you need to, to, to tackle this question of how to extend uh, the work of theater beyond this box or beyond this moment, but I'm, I'm still not sure this is something good for, the, for how we, why we love theater in the first place. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, Mina. Um, <clears throat> I, I still like to sometimes create a separation um, Maybe this is this is maybe this is a personal thing, but between things that I do in the like art world or you know the the, the more um, fictive realm and the, and and activism, and um, and I think there is space for certain things in 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 particular on particular platforms, and maybe that space cannot carry the weight of other, uh, and it's okay. It's also okay not to, you know, not to artivism uh, or not to like m have this urge to, 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 to mix and match, uh, which, which was the case after the 2011, uh, after the uprisings where, you know, curators would parachute in and want to create some kind of sense and to make that sense to mix it somehow and to, to bring it together and then put it on the walls of the gallery. And I think this is... This is what we're not doing here, which is which which is great because we can see how much value there is in the in the in in, in the object itself and in the imagination of that object and how much how much um, s power it carries, like how, how what 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 kind of change it, it it brings in by its sheer existence or its sheer moment from one day to to the next with through each performance and and the uniqueness of each voice, like it voicing something else each day. Um, but to respond to, to the second slash third question about platforms, there's this, there's, there's this interesting uh, platform uh, called um, Pandora, which is open source. And it's, uh, it's, it, 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 it's good for archiving independently from, from uh, already existing uh, media. Uh, and also protecting identity uh, from uh, state uh, um, uh, uh, control, um, and uh, and we are using such platform as Musarin. Uh, um, uh, we're using that platform, Pandora, and we ingested over 800 hours of raw footage filmed during these years and collected during those years up until 2014. Uh, it's called 858.ma, and um, and the reason why I, I find it powerful is that it gives you a lot of options um, after uploading the footage. Uh, it gives you different options of how to navigate through history, which is not a a to, 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 to Z timeline. It is actually it can be spiral, and it, you can navigate it through a map or through sound, or you can look at it from a, the perspective of like a specific time code or a phrase that's been said or a, or a chant that's been heard repeatedly. So I think what it allows us to, allowed us to do, and, we, and, and it's a project that never ends, so it's a sense there's no beginning and end to it, is to go and to continue on tagging and creating these different vocabularies for for the archive, so it is a it is a media archive. It, it is from that specific period. But how do you navigate through these voices without editing them down to something that it is not no more? Meaning, there was a purpose to edit something down and to be to to counter propaganda them and to make videos that are very specific and and and, and even manipulative uh, during the revolution during those two years where one when we were allowed to do that. Um, and, but now is also the time to, to do think about the ways of not just preserving it and remembering it, but still uh, learning from it and, 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 and navigating through uh, uh, these different in and out points that can be um, made uh, 
uh, limitlessly. I can, I can show you later, because I'm talking about specific technology. It's not, I'm not talking like some kind of uh, imaginary metaphor. <laughs> I'm specific to the language of that software and creating smart lists, and like, it's, it's very interesting. I will comment quickly about Bonaire. <laughs> uh, it's a fantastic city, uh, uh, but uh, I mean, we do, we do a weekly event with my colleague who's sitting in the front row here. Last week we had 300 people show up. Um, uh, Berlin is excellent, but, but this whole idea that in the West you have absolute freedom is not true. Um, in, in Berlin you can't talk about Palestine. It's, it's toxic. There's something, whenever I say we'll do something about Palestine, uh, everyone sort of freezes. And so one thing, one way we did talk about Palestine was talk about Palestine through art. Mm -hmm. So we said we're going to talk about Palestinian art. And in doing that, we were able to talk about so many issues about Palestine. But had it been, let's talk about Palestine in Berlin, I don't know whether we would have been able to carry through with that event. So art allows you this space. Under the cover of art, you can talk about issues. I said, this is just an example. Um, and with regards to documenting, I think archiving, there was a question. Um, a lot of the artworks we buy are damaged. Uh, we have to restore them. Sometimes it costs more to restore the artwork and preserve it. Um, we are one of Google's biggest uh, partners in the Middle East. We have over a thousand artworks on display. We partner and we work with many universities and professors. A lot of teachers contact me and say we want to show these works in class. Uh, do we have permission? Of course we give permission because this is why art is, uh, is there. Um, but I think art uh, should be experienced uh, firsthand. I think you should, be see, you should see art firsthand. Uh, and so another problem with Berlin is that uh, the, the, the main museums in, in Germany don't show you Middle Eastern art. The uh, temporary exhibitions show you as if Arabs are there temporarily, as if Middle Easterns are there for a few weeks, a few months, and then they leave. London has finally come to recognize that sort of people who are brown are here to stay, but Berlin hasn't accepted that yet. They still think that we're leaving. Uh, and so, uh, so yes, you know, it's a very interesting, it's a very interesting space. And I think having Yasmina and Muhammad and countless others pushing the narrative, uh, I think, is really, really important. Thank you. Well, we only have five minutes, and we need some hope before we go. <laughs> and Muhammad yesterday was telling me, I don't know if I'll have time to talk about hope. So here's a minute of hope per person, starting, um, <laughs> putting Muhammad on the spot, so maybe not starting with you. I, I, like Let's how, look. I, I like how you end every session with... Uh, we it, try, we I, try. I would call it the imposed hope. No, <laughs> no, no, no it's no. not. It's, no, no, it's, usually it's, in the region, it's imposed wars. Uh, no, no, but, 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 why, but why not? Why not? Honest, I, I, again, I'm speaking from a very okay. personal perspective. Every day I wake up and I ask myself why how can I continue? Not metaphorically, literally. Yeah. Sorry, I'm, I, I don't want to spread uh, pessimism yeah. or like. <laughs> but then, then with, 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 and, and I, we spoke yesterday. We spoke about memory, justice, and hope. And I told Lena that hope is the only topic that I'm, I, I all the time think about it, but I can't come with anything concretely because with memory, the question of memory, the question of justice. I'm already working. I have already some projects. Some projects will, will happen soon. But with hope, I'm still clueless. It's, it's just something that keeps me all the time um, busy. But um, the only thing is, I, I, ha I have to say that we have to find a way to invent hope without falling in the tra trap of uh, uh, fake optimism. And this is very tricky. So how can we, we, we walk this thin line? And for me, I heard wonderful talk about the grassroots and what is happening. Yes, I agree, but, but I think maybe, and I'm sorry if this is, again, not very <laughs> spreading optimism, I think we need to also sometimes search somewhere else um, in the personal, um, in the tiny details that sometimes we take them for granted. Yeah, absolutely. Really, really, like in the, in the small joy. Of, uh, because I think to laugh today is how I resist Bashar Assad also. Seriously, because he wants me to cry, uh, metaphorically. And he doesn't he's the know one me, laughing luckily. Too, if I, so. yeah, yeah, <laughs> but if I, if I laugh, if I love, if I... I'm also resisting the oligarchs, the oppressors, the... the uh, seriously, not... And this is maybe how I can, want to invent hope on a daily basis, by uh, taking into consideration the small things, not just to think... And I myself was fanatic Marxist, but now I want to, to focus on the small things, yeah. on the daily things, maybe. This is how I invent hope. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, we're really running out of time. So, Leila, very quickly, 
maybe 30 seconds on hope? Well, I'll try. Uh, I think for me also, I mean, hope is always such a difficult and rather ethereal question. But I'd say that maybe it helps if you think about politics, not uh, always in terms of the future that you want to project in these kind of meta uh, ways, but to think that all that we really can do in the best way is to build our present, to kind of create a layer for the present that is beautiful, that is meaningful, that is intelligent, interesting. So I think all of us can try and build something uh, towards a small layer of our present. And we hope that we can use that as a springboard, as a trampoline for a more interesting and better future. Thank you so much. Yasmina, over to you. 30 seconds on hope. <laughs> um, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll give you my 30 seconds on hope. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're praying past the hope. Um, I'm post, post hope. I'll cut it in half. There's an Arabic saying uh, that goes, Ma aviq al aish lo lawla fushat al amali. And I think that, that, that tells you. Can you translate? Uh, you trans, you're the trans. Yeah, huh? <laughs> it's, it's, it's impossible to live. Oh, no, it's not no. a good translation. It's impossible to live without the space of hope. No? Yeah. That's, uh, yeah. Some, something like that. Like uh, living would be constricted without a, the, the space for hope. Uh, English is such an ugly language. <laughs> I, 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 I very much learned a lot today, including Sultan's indirect reminders of the fact that the West is not a panacea. Thank you so much for that, whether the English language or the restrictions of free speech in, in Germany uh, or the patriarchal uh, frameworks uh, used in our museums here in, in, in Europe. Thank you for reminding us of that, actually. Very important. Um, it's not an East-West type uh, binary. So on that note, that gives me hope. Thank you so much, everyone.